We're now right into the final stretch of the summit. And in this plenary session, looking forward, we're really trying to live up to the idea of moving from being pro reactive to being proactive. And to kick us off, before we have a final plenary, a final plenary panel, uh, I'd really am very happy to be able to invite Desmond Alugnoa to the stage. Desmond, you're going to give us um, a, something of a, a challenge, I hope, for our final uh, panel discussion. Uh, you're the co-founder of Green Africa Youth Organization and the program manager at the the Africa Climate and Zero Waste as well. Welcome to the stage, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much, Robert. Looking forward, in 2015, three university lecturers from Cape Coast made contributions for me to go and register an organization which will later be called the Green Africa Youth Organization, because they had seen with passion how much we were determined as young people, mobilizing our colleagues to make a change. At the time, the government of Ghana had not employed new staff for five years. And it will not do so for a decade. Because even though there were so many hundreds and thousands of young people graduating from universities, the government had had a bailout from IMF. And some of the conditionalities were that they were not able to create jobs, they were not able to expand that space of employing more people. So at this point, when I was sitting in a minivan called Trotro, going to the capital to register and get the le legitimacy for us to operate, what I was thinking about is, whatever solution we are going to provide, it must have job creation potential, because that's what the government will be interested in. It must be revenue generating, and it has to be scalable, because these were the reality of the people at the time. So as we are closing today, I'm wondering what is our collective reality? Can we achieve universal health equity through pursuit of a toxic free world? Maybe. So as Robert mentioned, my name is Desmond Aluno. I'm from Ghana, and I'm co-founder of the Green Africa Youth Organization, a youth-led gender balance organization that is brokering solutions at community level in the areas of zero waste, disaster risk reduction, and climate change. Waste, as we know, is a significant source of chemicals, which is the reason why we are here today. When I was growing up, I used to draw water from the well using used containers that had paint or bitumen coatal. And it was normal. All our mothers, this is what we were using. There's a huge reuse culture from where I come from. You can imagine the shock when we were told later that these containers had intolerable amounts of chemicals that were not good for our body. It doesn't stop there. My cousin passed on, reusing a container that had contained pesticide to make food. And when I was in the university, my good friend, his elder brother, who was paying his school fees, worked at Agbubuloshi, 
one of the largest electronic waste dump sites in Accra. Doing scrap and salvaging whatever he can find to sell. For two weeks, we did not hear from him. Only later for us to hear that he stepped on a fluid substance that started irritating his skin. The doctor said it had poisoned his blood and destroyed his organs. He was no more. So, in 2018, fast forward, I decided, and this was the peak where climate activism was beginning to, to rise. We all have heard of the Greta Thunberg effect. It was very more interesting to stay in the city and be connected with people because you had the likelihood of being spotted by the media or by whatever when you are doing activism. But again, the reality at the time. So I had to move to a pre-urban area to test a model called the Sustainable Community Project. The model rests on ensuring that there's a movement that is built to understand how to approach waste in general. And that movement should understand how to generate income from the waste, diverting huge piles of waste from landfills and dump sites, composting huge amounts of organic waste. Those that are hard to degrade, we turn them to charcoal briquette, talking of rice husk, coconut husk, palm kernel, and of course, the plastics, we had to find ways to recycle them. Some of them shredded or pelletized and shipped anywhere there's a market. This, today, is happening in five municipalities in Ghana, it's happening in seven municipalities across Africa, and it's happening in three countries in Africa. The model has been able to scale as I expected it to do. It has been able to generate income for those who are engaged, but significantly, it has been able to recognize the true heroes of our society, the informal waste workers, and the young people who are brokering these solutions. Because at this point, before when we were starting, there was a disconnect that the informal waste workers who were taking so much recyclables and helping us to expand the lifespan of the landfills were recognized as criminals being chased away, if you got hurt picking waste, you couldn't go to the hospital because nobody would be willing to take care of you in that your dirty condition. So we had to go through a series of explanations to the various municipalities that we worked with to let them understand the value they were missing and to integrate these people, certify them, and in most cases, give them access to health and insurance so that they can operate just like everyone else because they are important like everyone else. To succeed and to pursue our collective reality from here, from the conversations that we've had, I think that we need to recognize that there are false solutions. Yes, from what I'm telling you, I think that we should also recognize solutions can come from anywhere. And if we will have to equip a university in Mali because they are closer to the problem to research and find solutions, we need to believe, we need to trust that solutions can come from anywhere. But again, there are also false solutions everywhere. Recently, 
I got an email from a city official from Africa. And what he was saying was not unique. He was saying that they were in a meeting with investors, and these investors were talking to them about waste to energy, incineration as a solution to the pile of waste that they had. But then an official from Accra, the capital city in Ghana, mentioned to him about a certain zero waste approach that we had implemented in Ghana, in Mali, in Uganda, and he thought that it was interesting, but he wanted me to convince him what were the benefits. Because apparently this other group was telling them that you can put your waste in this monster. Well, they wouldn't use the word monster, but a plant. And it will change it into energy for you because for a country that is already not having enough energy, you would be interested in something like that. So what I said was that your reality is that you have a government that is struggling, living on borrowed money. You have weaker regulations as a country. You are not able to hold people accountable. And your economy is struggling. Do you think the best way to invest your money is to bring in a huge plant that you cannot enforce the regulations to ensure that it has enough filters to not further pollute your population, that you cannot even guarantee that you have a model for you to segregate at source, like our zero-waste model is doing? Do you think that what they are telling you, if you put all the waste together like you have been doing, it will give you the energy they are promising. You have to recognize that investors and the corporate and industry have their interest. And you, as a city official, also have your interest, and you understand where you come from. You understand what your people need. In the end, it came, back, it came down to, well, yes but there are other associated benefits to what they are promising. Because they are saying that we will be able to save money, we'll be able to do this, and certain Western governments will take this and probably sponsor us. Well, maybe that is true, that they will get some additional sponsorship through this. But it is not true that they will save money because we have similar plans and they are not saving money. The plants are not even operating because the basics are wrong, and so the plant cannot operate. So, in the end, what I'm trying to say is that today, and this discussion we have had, is beyond the room. I think it's a call to action I think it is a call for us to recognize that leaving no one behind will require that we align our efforts, that we promote collaborations, that we put words into action, and that we recognize that solutions can come from anywhere but only if we collaborate that we can scale those solutions and we can hold people accountable. We can be transparent and we can build trust only if everyone believes that we are pursuing the same goal and we are doing it for the benefit of everyone else. Thank you.